live. We're live. Hey, everyone. How's it going? It's Nick Baldwin, co-founder of Lab Code Agents. And today we have a special guest, um, the woman who gave birth to me, Roberta Baldwin. My mom is on the show today for our special Mother's Day tribute. My mom is a realtor. She's been a realtor for probably almost three decades, if not three decades. So 30 years. Um, she's been a top agent in the Northern New Jersey market for a very, very long time. She had the number one sales team in Essex County for a very long time. I don't know the exact amount of years, but mom, you could get into that. Um, and she was a co-owner of KW NJ Metro group for about 11, 12 years. And everything about real estate, I taught her myself. No, she <laughs> taught me a lot of the uh, a lot of the way that I did real estate, the way I thought of the consumer, the way I was very customer service driven. And being that my mom has been in the business for 30 years, you know, she has adapted very well over the last 30 years from the MLS being a book to the MLS being online and to always being curious about technology and you know, she's always poured into her clients and that's why over all these years, she's still um, doing extremely well and has a team that does over a hundred transactions a year. So hi, mom. Thanks hi. for being here. Hi, nice to be here. Nice to meet you, mom. I'm just yeah. kidding. Um, <laughs> mom, it's you. Well, you know, no. to, to be very honest, um, yeah. when I got into real estate, you were a, a young teenager and maybe you're saying, it's nice to meet you because I was an absent mother. Uh, you were not. <laughs> you were not an absent mother. Stop it. You were a working you mom. Say that? Yeah, working mom. You are a working mom. That's that's a there's a difference. I yes, didn't there. ever think of you as an absent mom. You are a working mom. So let's go back to you know, real estate wasn't your first career. I don't think. Well, now it seems to be people's first careers. But I think if people have been in the business for a long time, uh, you know we find that it's typically wasn't typically wasn't their first career. So like, how did you get into it? Well, uh, my first career was my chosen career, which was journalism. I wanted to be a writer, a journalist ever since I was about eight or 10 years old. And I had a particular interest in the arts, music, movies, theater, music. And ultimately that's what I, uh, learned and that's what I went to school for and I got my first job at 23 working for um, a newspaper the uh, flagship newspaper of the Gannett chain which ultimately that chain ultimately uh, started USA Today which was lucky for me later on but um, I had a 20 plus year career in journalism um, starting as a you know staff writer and ending up as a critic and a uh, celebrity journalist um, and I wrote for Matt magazines, major magazines and newspapers for 10 years, and then went back and was a managing editor of a major newspaper uh, covering all the fun stuff um, until I made a break in my um, early to mid 40s. I thought, is this what I want to do forever? Um, will the career see me through what else is out there without getting more advanced degrees? And um, you know, the way people say they love houses, so they went into real estate. Um, it really doesn't work anymore like that, but I did enjoy reading those real estate magazines. And I had already had my thumb on houses coming and going. And I thought that my skills, you know, the grit that I had, the fierceness, the organizational talents, marketing that I knew how to do um, would serve me well. And uh, everyone was shocked that someone like me would go into journalism, I mean, go into uh real estate, but I did. And so that was about 1995. So it's not exactly 30 years, but approaching. Well, yeah, <clears throat> almost, which is something to be proud of. Like, I don't want to say because no. it it's like a long time. It's something to be proud of to, yeah. to, I think in this, especially now with technology to still be selling real estate all that time later with so many agents kind of falling out of the business because they're not adapting. You know, one yeah. thing that I've always told you and I've told other people is, you know, part of, part of the reason you're still in business and doing well is because you have always been open to, um, you know, adapting and pivoting. Uh, and you've been through a lot of different ups and downs in the market. 
So I want to go back though and talk about like your very first year in real estate because um, I think it's an interesting story uh, and I think it could uh, help a lot of people who are kind of maybe stuck in a rut because you didn't make that much money, <laughs> right? Like what was it? Something like $20,000 or something your first yeah, year? Yeah, so business? my first year, don't forget, it was this was a long time ago, but um, I allowed myself uh, the option of not being a superstar the first year. And in fact, I sought out, um, I, I joined Prudential in my the town that I lived in, uh, Montclair, New Jersey, which was a small agency because I wanted to learn the business without uh, anyone hovering over me. I'm a kind of independent learner. Um, unlike, I mean, a lot of people have to take classes and they have to, you know, they need to have teachers, but I wanted to learn it myself without people breathing down my neck. And so my first year on my own, somehow I did 11 transactions um, and I made $25,000. They were all little condos. They were little tiny houses. I basically forced people to buy. Um, I, the organization that I was in had no person answering the phone back then. So I basically got to the office at nine and pretended to be the secretary. And I got all the phone calls. No one else was interested in them. And that's how I got my first clients, um, including a woman who was then on my team for almost 10 years, who's now a top producer today, and many, many people who um, called in and were essentially at the bottom of the bucket in terms of ability to buy or sell. And I just worked each and every one of those. A after Nick's homework was done and my daughter's homework was done, I got on the phone around 8.30 or 9 and I just... I kept on pushing these people and uh, that's my nature. But, uh, but the second year I, uh, I uh, tripled my income and the third year I joined the uh, number one boutique company in the town and I uh, quadrupled or, you know, my, my income what? went way up once I decided to learn from the best and felt confident that I could compete with that level. What I mean, was a lot of people the, today go right to the top agencies, you know, and they and they yeah. they have lessons all day long and coaches. We had none of that back then. Yeah. Well, yeah. what was the first? Thing, what was the thing that you did in your second year that helped you triple your income? Because you know you were kind of like a lot of agents just flying blind. Like there wasn't a lot of training and yeah. I realized I didn't know the names of the streets. Uh, around me. I didn't know uh, because I had been, I had had a career that was not local, right? I was never in the PTA because I was too busy. Um, my kids were not sports oriented, quite the opposite. And uh, so I realized I had none of the um, contacts that people usually have, but I was very lucky. I met a young couple my first year and I sold them a foreclosure and she was getting her master's degree in writing at NYU. And she introduced me to six people who came out here that were all writers, young writers uh, who were either getting degrees or were working for magazines or newspapers. And I started to work my, um, you know, work with people who were kind of a little bit like me and um, pushing them each to do, you know, to go to their limit and to get a great house. And I just was fierce. And I, I would say that my main, my main uh, personality trait is grit. So um, I, I work that all the time. And also um, having interviewed celebrities for so many years, um, I was great at research because when you're talking to someone who has achieved a lot and you're you know, 25, 30 years old and you've been given this opportunity, you need to know how to uh, you know, uh, be, be their equal come in and, uh, and, and allow them to talk to you uh, because they understand that you have information and that you, you know, have skills. So I just transferred that right to real estate. In other words, when people said, well, how long have you been doing this? I would say uh, quite a while now, you know, whether it was three months or three years. So, you know, that sort of bravado, which I think we all have in our family, um, yeah. really was a uh, part of, I think, the skill set that I had. Um, you know, real estate is not for uh, shrinking violets. Uh, I think personality is important. Good personality, obviously, you know, so, and it was, has always worked for me. 
yeah, carry, think, you know, being able to carry the conversation forth. Uh, and now in the career that I have, you know, I deal with a lot of top end people, uh, not exclusively, but um, you know, Wall Streeters, people who are, you know, um, startup CEOs, you know, and you need to be on their level. So um, I'm very into data now in the last stages of my career. Yeah, I think, you know, we're, you're, we were, you're still there, but we were in Northern New Jersey and, you know, a lot of your buyers are Wall Streeters and finance people and a lot of your sellers are similar. So, you know, you have to kind of know how to have that conversation with them. But I also think like, yeah, I think real estate is hard for a lot of people for a lot of reasons, but it also, it, may, it kind of forces you to be outgoing and conversational. Uh, and I think, you know, with, I had, you know, we come from a family of performers. Like I was an actor and a singer, you know, my mom and her sister were singers and performers and my sister was a dancer. And so that stuff really helps you step out of your comfort zone. This morning I was talking to someone who said they started taking improv classes, you know, to help them with their real estate to oh, step out idea. of their comfort really zone and be idea. more spontaneous. Yeah. I think that's a great idea. Improv classes. Oh my gosh. Remember when I would take those? Yeah. Um, but okay. So you have been primarily, you know, a sphere of influence based agent. And in this day and age, it's even harder to maintain that because of all the noise and digital marketing and sales calls and so on and so forth. How do you continue to be repeat and referral after all this time? What, do you, what are you doing that we should know about? Well, first of all, I have to say that like any other career, you have your, um, you, you know, it, it's sort of on an arc, right? Um, you have the part of the arc where you're going up and you're achieving more every year than you did the year before, hopefully. Right, you know, you hit the three, uh, the three year, the five, the seven. Suddenly, you're at ten years if you're lucky, and you know you're maintaining an income and you're using all of the, the skills and tools that are available. When I was at that stage, it was personal websites. It was before oh, yeah. Zillow. It was before Trulia. Before all of these um, corporate entities got on the first, second, third, and eighth page of Google. So you know. People like me who had great websites were hauling in the, the buyers and the sellers. So that was an enormous help. It not only made my career and my income, but it made the careers of a half dozen people who worked with me on my team. Uh, and for a long time, I had the number one team for about, I don't know, 10, 12 years in this area. And now they're, the, well, Nick isn't doing it anymore, but all the rest of them are hugely top producers on their own. And one of them is my business partner, Nancy Chu, who occasionally writes articles for Oh Lab yeah, Code. Nancy writes articles for Lab Code agents. Yeah. And Very so good. we- And yeah, Nancy so we, has a, 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 a theater background. She yes, has- she's with a director. playwright and a director, yes. Yeah. I, I think creativity helps in this field um, for those who have it. It's not something to suppress because you're in a, a business um, you know, area and many of the people that I have worked with, you know, secretly have interests in fields that I, you know, that I've been involved in. So that's been good also. But um, if you're asking me, how did I maintain it? Um, I would say that now after, you know, 26, 27 years, um, there's a huge group of new agents who are 20, 30 years younger than me. And their kids are in school and playing soccer um, and they uh, may get on the phone for five hours a day, every day. Um, you know, real estate is very different today than it was 10, 20 years ago. I think a lot of the uh, nuances and the hum humanity of it um, isn't there anymore for the newcomers. And they're being, you know, pushed to achieve more and more listings and more and more sales. And of course, that is one function of success, right? But mm -hmm. for me, I've been able to manage through all the years a uh, database of people I've worked with um, when co COVID hit and we all had a couple of months where we didn't know what was happening, if anything. Um, following that, I got a call, calls from probably 10 of my former clients who had friends in New York who were desperate to get out. And um, 
while there was a lot of misery and sadness of, the, of last summer, uh, there was something very powerful about that critical mass of people that I served well, who wanted to introduce me to another group of people. And so um, it's been a very good year uh, in many respects, um, while of course acknowledging all the heartache in the world, uh, which none of us want to forget, even yeah. if we're successful in real estate. Um, but I will say that, um, you know, a lot of real estate companies like Keller Williams and uh, and others, you know, have new programs very, you know, they're heavy on process and information and learning. And I think it's harder for older agents. There's no question, you know, we're catching up with a lot of that. And I think that's natural. And so um, someone on Lab Coats this morning posted about, uh, posted the, the phrase in a paragraph, you know, you know, how much is enough in a career? And so um, I look back well, on mine. I want to I wanna preface that a little bit with how much is enough in terms of when we were talking earlier, you said, you know, in, well, I think any sales position, but mm -hmm. real estate, yeah. that's where we're in. There's so much focus on, you know, make more money, make more money, sell more houses, more units, more volume, more, 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 mm -hmm. more, bigger team, yeah. more agents. Like, okay, when do you decide, you know what? Like, okay, that's it, enough. We don't need to do more, 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 more. So, yeah, well, good, so that was for me in 2015 when Nick was deciding to go off on his own and uh, other people on my team who were I incredible. Know, 2017. Well, it, it was working its way up. And yeah, yeah, um, yeah, yeah. people were saying they wanted to go out on their own. And we brought three new people on the team, all of whom were. Uh, had to be taught. We spent a year bringing them up to the level that I felt was important, but they, one had three kids, another one had a husband lost his job, the third one had a divorce, and um, <laughs> coupled with the yearnings of the people who were on the team who had been with me seven, eight, ten years, which is amazing for any team, um, I, I looked at myself and I said, you know what, the complexities of keeping this team going at the high level that it was at um, is too much for me. And so I stepped back and for a year and I just had my assistant with me. And then I joined another team that's the mechanics of which make it easier for me to be the um, brain maker that I am. I'm not involved in the day-to-day -day counseling of all the people on the team uh, we have we have a whole group of people who put up the signs and do all of that and do the Facebook ads. And my presence on the team is really to work my um, my past clients and to bring new ones on based on my reputation. And that's probably a late stage agent's um, fondest wish to be able to do business and to know that we don't have to do all the little stuff that drags you down and keeps you from your grandchildren or you know, if you like to play golf or your new puppy. Oh, the new puppy that I got. Um, but that doesn't mean that, that I don't, you know, start my day, you know, at seven thirty or eight in the same way. Cause my curiosity has not diminished. Um, but I don't really, you know, there was a time when I literally spent every waking hour on the weekend in the car, right. I had four or five, six clients every weekend. We don't have the inventory for that, but also the, um, you know, being a little older, you have to decide, do you want to do that? That's how, is that how you want to live your life? Or can you make an honest, you know, income that puts you at the top 1% anyway, without being crazy? And I think that's where that comment comes from, how much is enough? Yeah. So for I, me, it's not having that team with 20 people on it. And while I, I see the photos of these, you know, incredibly beautiful teams, you know, uh, having had a beautiful photo shoot and stuff, I've done that. And um, I'm satisfied now to be at the level that I'm at, which some would consider to be very high. Yeah. And maybe it doesn't, you know, maybe it doesn't um, reflect, you know, my, my top years in terms of income, but more than enough. It doesn't matter really, you know, like it doesn't matter. Yeah. So, I mean, listen, you, 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 you have been doing this for a very long time and you've had an amazing run and you're Plus, so gone. I, I like to counsel people now. A lot of people call me for advice. 
um, yeah. you know, who work uh, in real estate, um, people who you would think would not ever want to ask anyone a question because they're too proud. But, um, uh, but uh, you know, I, I, I feel as if um, I serve that purpose also. I was one of the principals in our uh, Keller Williams franchise until uh, January of this year. And uh, that was an experience unto itself uh, that sort of was a cap on my career. And I don't want to diminish it. I was talking all about doing deals, but, you know, being in um, the higher level of, uh, of a franchise uh, company was a very special opportunity for me. So I want to just go back a little bit because, um, you know, you were probably the first, I mean, if not one of the first, I think you were the first, the first agent in our market uh, to establish, to establish a team, right? Like you were a single agent and uh, I I think then you brought on uh, another agent, Tamima. And I just remember when that happened and you had your name on the signs, Baldwin Dream Team. And this was what, like 1994? No, this was 2003 or four. Oh, yeah. okay. So I was, then I was out of high school. Okay. So 2003, 2004. And I just remember you had your- Yes, yeah, so what happened was- the sign. Yeah, So well, tried people to think you of thought a, you were crazy for, what is this team nonsense? What is this team nonsense? Yeah, no the, 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 top, the top producer in town at the time came to the first open house where we had put our sign, the Baldwin Dream Team out in front. Uh, and it was a little bit of a, like a, you know, kitschy name. And she looked at me and she was always respectful of me. Uh, and she said, are you insane? What is this? It's so embarrassing, she said. Uh, and I said, okay, well, you know, thank you very much for that um, support. And um, <laughs> yeah, and so I was the first to do a That's team. That's like a realtor to say anything that they're thinking. Yeah, and then I also was the first to, to do staging. Um, but staging was unheard of. So the first staging I did uh, require the use of furniture that I owned was in my living room. And my husband would come home and say, where's our furniture? You know, um, but I did that following. And of course, staging now has taken over the world uh, and we still do it. We have an incredible staging presence within our team. Uh, until COVID, I was the creative director of all the staging. Um, but I had to give that up. Obviously, it was not possible to be roaming around people's houses. But um, we found a solution to that with a really great stager. And we have a team of movers. And I still pick all the furniture. And we store it in, um, you know, in a storage facility. Um, so but all of that was there, first. Mom, and I had the first, I had the first um, real um, website. Yeah. Well, I want to talk about that. Because from there, like, I, you know, you you were first with a lot of things right like and one of the things that i've always loved is that you know you are never afraid to try something right and if when since and when i was on your team you didn't really have a choice like i made you try everything and so oh, we spent worked- like 10 or 15,000 a year on stuff that was totally not going to work you know we would yeah, uh, if, Jen tristan's would watching, around and- if, Trist- wait, if tristan's watching and he was before I was essentially doing lab coat agents without having the group. Like I would be like, mom, you got to try this new toy. You got to try this new site. You got to try this new thing. And, you know, she was always open to it and we would give it a couple months if it didn't work, you know, no love lost. We tried not to spend too much money on stuff, but you have to be willing to try things in order to keep going. Right. I had a little slush fund at the end of the year. It was a tax write off, but honestly, you know what, going back then and probably now, you know, when agents go on to lab coats and they say, have you ever tried this or that? There was no place to go to ask because right. no one was doing this stuff. So we plunked down our money and we, we mined the field. And if it worked, great. If it didn't, we tried to cut our losses and we went on to the next. Um, and um, yeah, but I think, uh, it, and it's interesting because I don't think that, I think I was ready to try things from the very beginning because in journalism, you know, you're always doing something new every day, right? Yeah. Um, but I wasn't prepared for all of the crappy stuff that was being sold, you know, to agents that didn't really work. And Nick and I would 
mine through these things and we would think what is wrong you know these are being these programs are being sold and they're just so atrocious and um a lot of the um the people who created these would come on and they'd say well you know your area is so different oh they would all say you know, right like, you know your 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 market is different i mean think of it think about it though i mean we were in northern new jersey most of these most of these tech companies were thriving in, you know, middle America, Midwest, where, you know, how, uh, where markets were much more vast and the housing houses were the same, you know, you'd be yeah. in a subdivision with three different types of homes. Um, mm -hmm. and in New Jersey, you know, every house is different. Literally every single house is different from the next, unless it's a condo, but that's what makes a lot of the AVMs like these automated value, um, uh, the automated value um, pieces of tech. That's what makes it so hard it, it, to to automate those things in New Jersey, uh, and and like Boston and those areas because every house is different. You could have a, a beautiful two hundred year old Victorian, and then a, a, a Cape Cod from the nineteen fifties, and then a nineteen twenties colonial next to that. To automate all of that stuff, in it doesn't those work. Areas, yeah. difficult it, it doesn't and so work. that's why and so, yeah and so doing when you're when you're doing the data for um pricing um in a normal market i mean now uh i don't know if people know uh we're one of the insane centers of of uh lo low low inventory and high bids and we're talking about not just you know Two percent or three percent over asking. We're talking about houses selling for thirty to fifty percent over asking. Um, data sort of loses its its glow. But um, you know, in a real market, uh, we, you need to really investigate every single house because it's different. You know, if it doesn't have a powder room, for instance, on the first floor, it makes it a very different house than one that does. And uh, and the age differential of these houses from you know eighteen eighty um, through now. Um, makes them harder to judge, you know, out of the box. I mean, so, remember we um, had that listing from 17. It was oh, older yeah. than, it was older than like the Declaration of Independence. Remember it was <laughs> like from early, early 1700s, we had this listing. It's like, how do you comp that? Like you can't, there's nothing around it that's anything similar, you know? Yeah, we had crazy. several of those. I had one that had no closets in the entire house because I guess people in the 1700s only had one, you know, one dress, you know, they didn't right. have to hang it, up, hang it up in a closet. Um, so yeah, so we had that to, to uh, as a challenge as well. Um, so, um, you know, uh, what, what I, what, you know, so I wanna talk about just, we talked about your team, we talked about how you got started, you know, you were the first to kind of, you know, adapt a website. And this was like before IDX when, you know, we had to man, I remember we had to manually upload your listings to your website, but that website was the most traveled single agent website in, in the country. County. Yeah. In the, yeah. And, um, and the leads that came in from that, I mean, we were, you were essentially doing Google ads without doing Google ads, you know? Well, we uplo hand uploaded every listing. Uh, uh, this, this is before IDX. So we had to get permission from the broker. And then we had a lot of fierce pushback from other agents in the office who felt that we were stealing their business. They didn't understand, you know, obviously it's a, you know, real estate is, you know, it's open to anybody. You, your broker has a listing and there's no reason if you get permission, why you can promote that listing? But there were people in the office who didn't get that. Now, of course, if you if you went to them and said, um, you "Remember when you screamed at me and said you were stealing my business?" They yeah. wouldn't remember because the world is so different. But I also had a blog. I well, I, I don't know. Wait one second because I want to go back to that because, like, yeah, you know, just like you started your team first, you had your website first. You were putting your own listings manually on your website, and you wanted to put mm -hmm. other agents in the office listings on your website and they said no and now it's just happens idx it just happens you know what i mean when you, you think back about all the things that you were doing that no one was doing and now everyone's doing it so one of the things that came out of that was starting a blog because if i couldn't it, you know if, if it turned out that i couldn't um run these as listings you know with, with pictures 
I did a blog every week for about 10 years called What's New in Essex County Real Estate. And I had about 10,000 people in the database and um, people looked forward to this on Thursday night. I mean, lots of people and um, they, uh, and it was a, a writer's blog, really. I mean, I talked about myself, my family, the, the houses. I, I gave uh, I gave information on what sold and what didn't. I mean, no one was doing that that then. And um, so, yeah. So that was a period when um, the the blog uh, and the website were extremely powerful, and they f they didn't just feed me, but they fed a team of agents who were um, very nimble. And um, we did 50 or 60 transactions a year back in the day when, you know, the average was three. Um, so, and then we, then there were a couple of years in there before 2008, when we did more than a hundred transactions as a small team of three or four mm -hmm. agents. Nick was part of that. Uh, Nick, you, one year you did 25 rentals, uh, which I didn't, oh. didn't, yeah. You almost, you almost died doing them, but um, you did 25 rentals that helped our bottom line. Yeah, uh, I remember my first year in real estate. Um, actually, um, I want to. Um, hey, Jake, I can share my screen, right? Just want to make sure. Um, yes, and I hope everyone can. I want to make sure that my volume is on, because I just want to give everyone a little taste of what my first year in real estate was working with my mom. <laughs> Realtors in the high school ah. real estate. Plus, can this rookie agent prove himself with a new listing? I'm going tell you about this awesome building. This one will really feel like I did this myself. We're going to do whatever we need to do to get these listings. <laughs> I'm Roberta Baldwin, my 13th year in real estate, uh, based in Montreal, New Jersey. My name is Nick Baldwin. Um, I was there part of the Baldwin team. Roberta Baldwin is the our team leader. She's my mother. <laughs> Nick is the newest member of the Baldwin Green team. Uh, he joined about a year ago. Well, you were embarrassing. <laughs> I also have four other people working for me. And my main concern was that they not see him as being the heir apparent, which he wasn't. It's good for the most part. Me and my mom have our ups and downs. We argue just like any mother and son would argue. They all look completely different, wouldn't you say? No. No? no. Okay, I'm wrong then. Yeah, she gets like these. All right, so that's enough of that. Um, <laughs> but yeah, let's talk about um, let's talk about Bought and Sold, the show that we did together. Okay, well, we did Bought and Sold. But, uh, it was the first real estate program. It was HGTV. Uh, they didn't really know how to do a real estate program. It actually got 2 million views the first week. Uh, and you would think, I mean, today, any cable show or, or um, third party show that got 2 million views would be, you know, would be wonderful. But back then, they didn't know what they were doing. And so it was a little bit cobbled together and chintzy. And, but it was great publicity for us. And we did it for two seasons, 2007 and 2009. Um, and, and yeah, 2009, by the way, was, was when, when I did on. it. Yeah. Very hard to do in the middle of an economic crisis where no one was buying or selling a house. <laughs> we, little known secret, had to make up stories. Literally make up. I had to come up with a storyline that was I mean, I did get the listings, but like the buyers that I brought in, like they were my friends, like no one was buying homes. You had to come up with stuff. Yeah. And you know, um, uh, what happened was I figured out the first season that the people, the agents who got the most attention uh, on the show were those who had stories, right? And of course, my previous career was all about story making. And so the second season, I made a list of 20 stories, you know, based on people we knew who might want to buy, might want to sell. And I presented it to the producers. We were on almost every week. And one of the other agents who had been um, chosen to be on the second, uh, the second season didn't get on at all. And she said, well, what am I doing wrong? I said, well, do you have any stories? Because yeah. the, the HGTV was not capable of coming up with stories. You had to do it. You had to present it whole cloth. Anyway, it was a great um, endorsement for us. 
and all of the people on the show were all different, all different personalities, um, points of view, um, uh, pers- and, and so it was. It was pretty interesting, and then um, and then it ended because uh, more sophisticated shows I think came up, like yeah. Million well, Ball. you recently did House Hunters. Yeah, I did that at the end of two thousand seventeen, and honestly, oh, um, that was that long ago. Wait, it aired. Yeah, yeah later it, though it's still airing yeah it's still airing okay. off and on and i was um i was privileged to have a beautiful couple working with me and um you could have you could see the difference between the production of the early show 10 years earlier and, uh, and this one you know where they knew what they were doing this time and there was a, a feeling of um accomplishment that we had at the end of that episode they invited me back but we're doing tv is very hard you know, it's very hard. It's such so, a it's such a difficult life, mom. It's so difficult. The fame. Yeah, the so I was happy to do it, but um, you know, <laughs> I wouldn't choose to do it every week. You know, I'm too vain to you know just yeah. and no one's it there to fun, tell though. me. It was fun. I have all this episodes on on the on yeah. DVDs. Yeah. Um. So all right. So when did because you know you you um you had your website. You're writing your blog and you. I had a background in journalism. So you've always been, you know, you always take your uh, listing descriptions very uh, seriously. And I think people in the office have asked you to write listing descriptions for them. But um, you started getting asked to do like Nightline and really big news programs. Like how did those things come about? Did those come about, you know, from just having that presence online, you know, before a, a lot of people did? I think it was a combination of maybe some people that I knew in the business from before, and also the fact that it, um, uh, at one point when this was possible, uh, you know, I was perceived to be someone who was everywhere. So, you know, you would see my banner here and, you know, a side ad there. I was spending a lot of money on marketing. Um, I, I think that for people who are um, trying to make it in the business, you have to separate yourself. And how are you going to do it? Um, if you look around at the people who are truly successful in today's marketplace, you know, they are, um, uh, they have a background in some form of marketing in some, in some, in a business that have to do with getting yourself out there, promoting yourself, having sales, uh, in some respect. Um, I mean, I used to sell myself and my stories, but, um, I was talking to a agent who's really made it big in the last four or five years you know, when he was head of a huge team in retailing, but he had the same skills, right? Uh, obviously, to selling at the highest level, um, working for a major company. And so, um, and I think the skill set has to be much, much wider now. You can't just put your, your sign in the front yard and think that you're going to hire other people to do it. You still have to have a taste level. You have to understand what uh, the buyers want, what the sellers want you know, what is the going level of presentation of houses? I mean, the amount of time we spent on our listings, getting them ready, even the smallest ones, you know, is some people might think we were crazy, but we've gotten listings from people who have perused the MLS and said, we choose you because you have the nicest looking listings. You know, that means something to them. They want their house to stand out. Yeah, and so, are- yeah, we got- you know, there was a woman who called me about three or four years ago, and her house was next to um, those high wires, right? Mm-hmm. You know, those, well, you know, so, whatever they're yeah, the wires, yeah. Yeah, the high tension wires. I drove up to it the first time and I thought, oh my God, you know, because, you know, that's a challenge here, yeah. uh, houses that are near high wires, whether or not there's a science or not. Anyway, we did the cutest job on that house, and it sold in one day. You know, and I drive by it all the time and I think, you know, I just I'm proud of the fact that we got those people on their way and she chose me for a reason and we produced, we, we answered her need um, and we spent money to do it and we were proud to, to have that listing, you know, float on by. So, um, yeah. Yeah, I think like, you know, with um, realtors, feeling like their career is in jeopardy or their commissions are being lowered or reduced, you know, it's about at this point, you have to give them the best possible value that you can 
you know, so the, so the commission is much more justified, right? Because, you know, it kills me when I see listings still to this day online that are taken with a cell phone and there's like underwear on the bed and it's not made, you know what I mean? Or there's a dirty litter box in the corner. Like, I just don't understand how we as a community or an industry can complain about how we're being pushed out of business yet we still deliver that you know what i mean well um, yesterday i saw a listing that had two dirty dish rags hanging you know and i you yeah. know but this is uh, not everyone sees the world the way we do so but but uh, there's certainly enough gu guidance and guidelines now for every realtor in the united states and abroad to be able to do it well uh and and if you need the help um, as we did this COVID year, you know, we started hiring a, uh, stager who had a long career and he's very, uh, he's younger, he's eclectic, he's interesting. And it was hard for me to give that up, but it was for the benefit of my sellers, right? If I couldn't do the job, I wasn't not going to do it. I had to find another way to do it. So, um, I remember the first uh, listing that he actually staged was my neighbor around the corner and I could see him what he chose and you know what was going on in the house was the strangest thing uh, yeah. and it wasn't what I would have done but it was beautiful and so I let that go a little bit and um, that house turned out to be the first house in April of 2020 that sold in our area uh, with uh, during COVID we even wondered if anyone would show up and we had 70 sets of buyers come in three days uh, in and out of that house in very organized order with their masks and their booties and um, looking at a, an exquisitely beautiful house. So yeah, did we spend more on that? Did we go the extra mile? Yes. I also, you didn't even ask me about this. I often serve as a general contractor for houses oh. that need to be redone. I, I actually, uh, you know, they ripped out that kitchen and I chose everything to go into it. And um, it, you know, was, there, there's a certain kind of, uh, for me, yeah. that's the fun part. Um, and it's not Creative. intimidating to me, you know. One of the things that, uh, you know, one of the things, the staging aspect of it, when I moved up here to Michigan and I did have my team as I was team leader, uh, you know, people were like in my market center staging. What are you talking about staging? And so I, you know, you have a whole basement full of staging. You have a garage full of staging. You know, we, and, and my wife was, uh, uh, you know, she helped out with a lot of staging and she did the staging here for my team in Michigan. And as I started doing it in my new market center, other agents in the market center were then calling Anne to use her services. And so, you know, it started this ripple effect because it wasn't something that people were typically doing up here. And that's all the more reason to do it, you know, because nobody else is doing it. And, uh, well, well, I'd like to so think that one I have of the you to think, I have you to thank for a whole garage full of, uh, couches and chairs and tables and things. Like well, that. a little secret. So Nick would call me like it's seven 30 in the morning and he wouldn't give me any advance notice. And he'd say, I'm coming over to, to pull some things for a light staging. Uh, okay, so <laughs> I you know, know. We, we, know, we know how to pivot, but I will say that one of the skills that I have bequeathed to you is you're a male person who knows how to stage a house. And, and I say that because stereotypically, I, I don't think it comes as easy to most guys to do this. Um, you know, maybe I'm wrong. Someone can answer that on a chat. But um, Nick uh, was funny because I would see the same couch move from house to house, Nick, in his neighborhood. You know, it was a really cute uh, crate and barrel couch. And I think it had seven different landings in one year. And they all oh, look yeah. different. Yeah. That was a good couch. It that was, was a good couch. And I remember, you know, we would stage even, like you said, the smallest of condos. You know, like there was a condo. One of the first listings I got when I started my own team was a condo for like $175,000 or something in Belleville. And yeah. the, the, you know, days on market in that condo were like 90 days or a hundred days. And we completely staged it from top to bottom and we sold it in 10 days. And so, you know, 
a lot of the reason is because the realtors don't put any effort into it. You know, I mean, it, it, it does work and it's been proven that staging gives a much higher perception of value to the buyer. So, you know, you got to be doing it in some way, shape or form. Well, virtually you know? every house now in, in the, in the communities around me are staged. Um, and so I'm not sure how that computes in the rest of the uh, world, but um, it's just part and parcel of what we do. And of course it does cut into ultimately for many of us, um, you know, what we get, because uh, although some companies will now give money that is given back at closing to sellers to do work like this, uh, and some agents won't pay for staging, for us it's value added. We have a huge collection of furniture and we just feel that this is really, really important. And most sellers are not capable of doing it themselves. They're happy to have you do it, but I don't feel right charging them for it. It's part yeah. of it's part of the well, the process that makes our our um, listings different and better. Yeah, I mean, you know, that's a conversation a lot of agents have. Do you charge for staging? Yeah, like you know, I. I in Michigan, I would, we had a, uh, you know, a menu, right. That we would go in and say, you know, yeah. here's, you can choose your commission and at different levels, we would offer different things. And, you know, some of it wouldn't be staging and some of it would, right. And then as the seller gets the choice, right. Right. And so you have yeah. to show them, um, you know, you have to show them the value and what comes with it, but, and it's worth so it. Every right? now it's and then, it. every now and so then you're going to, have well, mom, you're not going to put, you're not going to spend 5,000 on staging on a hundred thousand dollar condo. I mean, you have to be smart. No, I was just going to say that every now and then you have, uh, it's happened to us twice. We've had sellers who just couldn't, they said you, we could stage and then they hated it. And, um, they, they liked the way it was. Right. Uh, so there's that. <laughs> and so the next day we we took the photos and we and we took it down so every now and then every, one out of every 500 uh they just don't get it and that's okay too yeah 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 for sure well i want you to answer one last question mm -hmm. about you know what agents can be doing to you know what should they really be focusing on to just because right now I think we're in a very stressful, ang ang angst-ridden situation, you know, just mm -hmm. all around, you know, what can we do to keep ourselves from burning out, right? Like you've created a business model where, you know, you rely very heavily on your sphere of influence, but, you know, what can we do to keep from burning out? You know, because a lot of agents are, you know, hustling and grinding and making 10,000 calls a day. And, you know, that can only get you so far. What can we do to make sure that we have longevity? Well, some people are better than others at hobbies, um, right? Uh, you know, and uh, people who play sports even into their um, later years, I think that's a great gift to be able to do. I don't play golf. I wish I did. Uh, and I don't have access to a swimming pool. I like to swim. Um, but I do like to garden and I have a nice yard and I've spent more and more time doing that. Um, I also like music and I do listen to music. I, I, I'm a person who likes to go into New York and go to live theater and uh, concerts. That's obviously not been possible. Um, so that's been a real lack in my life. Um, I watch less television now than I used to. I know Nick watches more, but um, you know, you're- well, I don't watch as much as you think I watch though. Okay, but you like, like long, you like long form, you know. You yeah, know. I like to, you know, watch a series, but yeah. I'll only, you know, I'll I'm only watch or two a night you know i'm impatient i only watch like two episodes and i i want it to be over but um but i, I do think we all have to find something that we like to do I, I honestly during covid i have been cooking more and finding I'm, I'm a pretty good cook but i've been finding that i am probably more talented than i gave myself credit for and we've had some great meals um and we got a dog uh three two or three weeks ago and uh that's something that i wanted to fill my life and of course of course, I have yeah. grandchildren and um, and friends, but um, it's been a hard year, and everybody has tried to create business differently. I think uh, uh, for me, it's it's reaching out, which maybe I haven't done enough of, because you're you're questioning what's the right time, you know, for people, and there's always the worry that there'll be heartache on the other end, 
which is something that I care about not stepping on, you know, with a, a crass uh, comment like, you know, are you thinking of selling your house? Um, so I want to be very careful about those that I do reach out to. Um, I have a business that's very different from, you know, getting on the phone and making 50 phone calls a day. Uh, I sometimes wonder whether if I were starting in real estate now, whether I could do that. You know, yeah. I've tried it and it's, um, you can hire a team, of course, to do it, but it, it, it creates different kinds of relationships um, through time. And I was more interested in developing the 20 or 30 year relationship rather than the uh, in and out the door. So I think there's room for both kinds of realtors in the future. Mm -hmm. But I think that, that the sort of, I don't, I don't wanna say that I have an old style, but um, it's definitely different than what a lot of people are practicing today. And so, um, you know. Well, I think uh, with technology, there's all, there is now this need to get back to basics more so than ever, you know, because of the fear that technology is going to take away from, you know, that actual personal feeling or touch, you know what I mean? So there's a lot of, I mean, you even have technology that uh, can write handwritten notes for you, you know what I mean? With pen. So yeah, I know you've tried that. It, well, the, I love those. They, they're realistic. So, but my point is that there's back to basics technology, like just technology that's helping you do old school types of, you know, outreach. So that's kind well, of- Well, you know, I'm surprised, you know, I'm heavy into Facebook and I'm, I, I did Insta Instagram and I'm going to be doing it again uh, coming up, but I have two business pages on Facebook and I'm you know, what I do, I do in an organized fashion with uh, energy and flair. Um, I do have one Facebook page that's Roberta Baldwin House Whisperer. And yeah. Um, yeah, and, you know, a lot of people have said, you know, where'd you come up with that? Well, I don't know if it's that creative, but I, uh, and I've made myself into the House Whisperer on that particular business page. Yeah. Uh, so funny. what comes out of my mouth is because I I'm a whisperer about the best things in houses. So, you know, I create these little things for myself and I hope that people respond. And certainly enough, as we said before, you know, do you need 50 listings a year or you're satisfied with 25? Um, right. You know, so I'm reaching for a level at my stage in my career that feels good and makes me happy and also does a service for the community. And, and that's something that I'm always interested in doing. Um, uh, whether or not it's through my work or just privately. Uh, I get a yeah. lot of pleasure out of helping people. So right now I have two or three clients and, you know, they're, they're first timers. They know nothing. They have very low, uh, you know, price ranges, but I'm dedicating myself to a small group of people on, on separate from the 2 million or what have, what have you, because I feel I have information and a way to help them. And I think that's important not to forget that no matter where you are in your career. Yeah, no, I agree with you. I agree with you. Yeah. And so well, I think- Well, good, mom. Okay. This has been lovely. Yeah. Um, thank you for taking time out of your day to talk to me, talk to your son. Uh, I'm, just I'm just kidding. In front of- If this all is these... the only way that we can talk, well, this was great, yeah. you know? Yeah. Stop. It's and I just want to say that, uh, you know, I know this is, I, I have to say this, that, um, that whatever skills that Nick picked up from, uh, from being in my um, shadow, and it's hard to be uh, a family business in, in any business, um, you know, he was a good student, a really good student, and he used what he, he used what was important to him, right, mm -hmm. to uh, forge his career, and he discarded the rest that wasn't necessary. And I just like to think I played a, played a little part in, in who he is today. Well, so. you have mom, don't worry. Thank you. So, well, Thank thanks you. for being here. And uh, this was fun. Hope everyone yeah, got, oh, go ahead, mom. No, I'm just gonna say that, um, you know, if anyone wants to, has, an, uh, has a question for me personally, uh, they can always email me at Roberta Baldwin team at Gmail. Yeah, well, um, Claudia That's on the in the chat says she's, she wants to call you. So, you know. Okay. Claudia, please call me or just look me up. I'm, you know, yeah. I'm available. Yes. In between new walks with your new dog, with little Mia. Yeah. Um, all right, mom. Have a great uh, Friday and 
happy Mother's Day. I'll talk to you. Thank you. And on, happy Mother's Day to all the other mothers out there. Yes. Um, hopefully you can pull yourself away from showing a house on Sunday. Although, what did Nick do today? He sent me a new no. lead at, for someone who wants to see houses on Sunday. So, um, well, yeah. he said in the email, I he goes, I apologize. I know it's Mother's Day. But the yeah. guy also wants to sell his house. So I know I, I'm I'm with you, Nick. You know? I'm, with, I'm just saying it's funny. What did you tell us? Listen, sometimes you got to do these things. I know. We're I mean, not in a market I'm... now. We, you know, I remember, you know, when before when I first got into the business, we're not in a market now like we were in 2008 also, where, you know, you can't, sometimes you can't pick and choose. But if he wants to buy and sell, you know. You got to go for it. You have to go for it. Yeah, exactly. So, yeah, I'll, I'm going to go uh, for it. Don't worry. All right, mom. I'll talk to you later. Thanks a Thanks. lot. Thanks, everybody.